All right, let's see here. That's working, excellent. Very good. Okay, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason. Welcome to the CY Learning Mutual Fund six week complimentary bootcamp webinar number five. So, as I said, my name is Jason. I'll be your host today. I'm one of the regulatory trainers and study coaches here at CY Learning, and we're very excited to have all of you with us here today. Um, now, just quick uh, full disclosure I'm going to do the same disclosure as I gave you last week. We have been having just a, a few issues with the internet service here recently. No surprises. There is a lot of people working from home these days. So if I do momentarily um, uh, pause or, or freeze, don't worry. It usually only lasts maybe a second or two, but we will post a recording of today's live webinar. Usually it goes up Tuesday or Wednesday. I, I think um, last week, in fact, maybe the week before, I saw it go up on Wednesday afternoon. So if you look for it then, you can always watch this webinar again. All right. That being said, let's have a look at today's agenda and see what's on our plate now. Okay, good. It looks like a small agenda today. So um, probably take us maybe 20, 25 minutes or so to go through. We're going to talk, you know, start off with a discussion about wealth accumulation. We're then going to talk about tax slips. And then finally, we're going to take up some exam level questions with our instructor's take on how to approach these exam level questions. Okay. All right. Let's get started right now. And I think I just had a message come in. Let me just quickly check it right now. Let me see here. Okay. All right. I see a message came through. I'll have a look at that in a few minutes. Okay. All right. Where are we here? Uh, next slide. Okay. Next slide. Wealth accumulation. So, on this wealth accumulation slide, I originally wanted to call this making money with mutual funds. But then I thought to myself, you know what? Making money, yeah, maybe they'll confuse that with the Bank of Canada's monetary policy because it's the Bank of Canada that's actually responsible for making or rather the printing of money. So I ultimately decided to simply call this slide wealth accumulation. Now to be candid, most of us are not born wealthy. I mean, I certainly wasn't. I came from a family of very modest means. But by starting at a young age, by using the power of dollar cost averaging, and by staying invested, you know, through tough markets, it helped me to really build a nice little retirement fund that I should hopefully be able to rely upon later on in life when I get to that stage of retirement. Now, full disclosure, I've still got a long way to go till I get to that you know, that point, but uh, I think I'm going to be just fine. All right. So why invest in mutual funds? Well, it's simple. And you might've picked up on it from my little story. I just told a moment ago, it's to achieve your goals, whatever they might be. I mean, your goals might be the same as, or, or different than somebody else's goals, depending perhaps on what stage of life you're in right now. One of the most common goals that many people want to save for is retirement. Right? That's one of my big goals. But there are others. There's saving for the down payment of a house. There's saving for a child's education. There's saving for perhaps a dream vacation. Maybe a vacation, you know, far away overseas or, or down south, right? Or perhaps something as simple as saving for a cottage, right? And I know the prices of those have gone up a lot in the last couple of years, but who knows? The point is, is that investing in mutual funds can help you with all of these different goals that you or your clients might have in mind. Now, investment income can be comprised of interest income, dividends, capital gains, or even what we call a ROC, ROC or return of capital. And each type of income retains its own character and is taxed accordingly. So for example, interest income is taxed as regular income. Dividend income from Canadian corporations is typically subject to a dividend gross up and a dividend tax credit procedure. Capital gains, for example, is typically only 50% taxable, meaning that one half of a capital gain is usually subject to, you know, to tax, whereas the other half of the capital gain can go right into your own pocket. So what about return of capital? Well, this is simply where an investor is getting their own money back. And if you're going to get your own money back, your own capital, there's no taxes applied to it. Now, I want to be clear. 
what I've just talked about, this is all investment income that's earned by the fund manager within the mutual fund itself. Okay, within the mutual fund itself. Now, my third point here is about capital gains losses on the mutual fund. So let me give you an example, and this is gonna probably make a lot more sense. If an investor buys a mutual fund, say for $100, and then later on sells that fund for maybe $1,000, then all else being equal, the investor has a $900 capital gain on the mutual fund itself. And that should be pretty clear, okay? So again, you've got two different things. You've got the mutual fund earning investment income from the activities of the fund manager, and that income could be interest income, dividend income, capital gains, et cetera. Then you've also got capital gains that might apply to the mutual fund itself. Okay, now I'm not gonna dive into the details as this is all covered in our, our different CY mutual fund study guides. You know, and there's no point in me reinventing the wheel here today, but just be sure to refer, you know, refer to our CY mutual fund study guides or the course textbook if you need to, because the learning that you're looking for is definitely there. Now, also on our YouTube channel, one of the videos in our investment basic series is called, um, uh, taxation of investment income. So be sure to watch it if you haven't already. It's going to talk about much of these different things. Now, for those of you with an active CY Learning subscription to our official mutual fund series of videos, I know that we've got over 75 different videos in that series that cover many of these topics to much greater detail than what our free investor basic series does. So be sure to make good use of our mutual fund video series as well. Tax slips. Now, now a lot of people wonder, how do I keep track of the income that I'm paid from the mutual funds that I happen to own? Now, I've actually got two great answers for you. First, if your mutual fund is held in a registered plan, like an RSP or, or a RIF or a TFSA, then it doesn't really matter. Let me explain why by way of one of my most favorite analogies I like to use with people, okay? I'm gonna start off by saying a sentence and I want all of you to try to finish my sentence for me, okay? Ready? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That's right, that's right. Meaning of course, whatever stories or events occur in Las Vegas are not told and thus do not affect you outside of Las Vegas. And the same is true of registered plans. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite analogy ever. Anyways, any investment income or distributions that occur within a registered plan stay within the registered plan and don't affect you. That's the key point. Uh, withdrawals from most registered plans are taxed as regular income with the exception, of course, of TFSA or uh, tax-free savings account withdrawals because those are obviously tax-free. Now, Non-registered plans are different in that any investment income from interest, dividends, capital gains or losses for that matter, any distributions such as return of capital, etc., must be properly tracked and recorded for tax purposes. However, don't worry. Mutual fund companies make this job much easier for you by way of tax reporting slips. So, so for funds that issue units, right, which technically units come from a mutual fund trust, you can expect to receive a T3 slip, okay? For funds that issue shares, again, technically shares come from a mutual fund corporation, you can expect to receive a T5 slip. Let me see if I can bring that up here on the screen for you. Um, yeah, there we go, okay. Now, I wanna be clear about these T3 or T5 slips. These are issued to investors at the end of the year when funds have made distributions during the course of that year. So distributions for mutual funds can consist of interest income, dividend income, even capital gains or return of capital. Now I'm not going into the details again of each of these different types of investment income as they're covered quite well in our respective CY Learning mutual fund study guides. However, I do want to mention this. When you buy or sell the actual mutual fund units or shares themselves, you can also expect to receive either a capital gain or loss, and this capital gain or loss is separate from any distributions that the mutual fund may have made 
on your behalf. Okay? All right, let's move on. What do we have next? I think it's questions and answers. Yes, it is. It's questions and answers. This is my favorite topic. All right, you guys ready? Let's put on your thinking caps right now. And again, I promise you guys, short video today. All right. Question number one. Let's read the question. Let's see here. ABC Fund has total assets of $10 million, liabilities of $1 million, and 350,000 units outstanding. Assume the fund charges a 3% front-end load and the MER, that's a management expense ratio, of 2.5%. And here's the actual question. It says, which of the following tax slips would the fund issue at the end of the tax year? A, a T3, B, a T4, C, a T5, or D, a T1G Schedule 1? Okay, okay. This is a good question. It seems to have a lot of moving parts. Um, I, I, I want to make a quick point for anybody that's really closely paying attention, all right? This scenario is identical to one of the scenarios that we posed last week. Okay, it's identical. But the question itself is different, right? Which is why it's so important to RTQF. Read the question first because this has got a different question but the same scenario as one of the ones last week, all right? So, again, there's a number of distractors in here. Um, assets, liabilities, uh, the, the amount of outstanding things, front-end loads, MER. These, these are all things that I don't think actually relate to the question at hand. Okay, it kind of looks like a complicated question, right? But is it? I mean, what, what, what do we really need to know to answer this question? Well, there's, there's no mention that this is a registered plan. So because there's no mention or no hint that it's a registered plan, we must fairly assume that it's non-registered. Okay, but, but I mean, what do we know for sure? Well, let's use that process elimination. Let's have a look at these four different answer choices. What do you have here? Um, we've, got, we've got A, a T3, okay? So we know that T3 slips are issued by mutual fund trusts, okay? That's, that's a possible answer. Uh, B is a T4. Well, I, I, you know, a T4, a T4 is actually your statement of employment income that's issued by your employer at the end of your year. So I think that's false and we can probably eliminate that one. So B is gone. Right? C is a T5. Um, I think a T5 might be a right answer. It's a possible choice. Okay. D, though, is a T1G Schedule 1. That, that's a fancy answer. It's kind of long, right? That's actually just your income tax return. A T1G is your income tax return, and, and a Schedule 1 is a, is a subset of your income tax return that, if memory serves me correct, is where you calculate the actual amount of taxes owing on it. From a, from a federal and provincial point of view. So I think we're going to probably eliminate D. So to be clear, we've kept the answer choice A and C, but we've eliminated answer choices B and D just from our own knowledge. Okay? So let me ask you guys, what kind of a mutual fund is this? What kind of a mutual... You know what? Is there any key words that really matter in this scenario? Any key words? What do you guys think? As I'm reading this, you know what stands out to me? This word right here, this word units. In fact, let, let, me, let, me, let me highlight that word. Let me see here. Okay, there we go. There's a highlight on that word units. This word stands out to me. You know why? Because I know that mutual fund trusts issue units, but I also know that mutual fund corporations issue shares. And it doesn't say shares anywhere in this question. It says units. So because it's a mutual fund trust that issues units, and I know that mutual fund trusts issue T3s, I think that that's probably going to be the right answer. I think the answer is going to be AT3s, right? So just by knowing that one key word in this whole scenario, I, I, I think this scenario is actually a lot less complex than what it may appear to be at first glance, okay? Let, let, let's just quickly find out. Let me find out if this is the right answer. Let's see. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All right. So, so the key point here is don't let the size of the question, you know, frustrate or intimidate you. You know, read the question first. 
make sure to read all four answer choices clearly, go through that process elimination, but always ask yourself, okay, what do I know? What, you know, can I eliminate and, and narrow it down? That whole process elimination is designed to help you, okay? Complex, but actually a really simple question. <laughs> All right, let's move on. What's question number two hold the store for us? Let's see here. Mandy. Okay. Okay. Mandy invested in a mutual fund held outside of a tax sheltered plan. During the year, the fund allocated her share of capital gains that the fund generated. Mandy received a T3 slip, which reported a $1,000 distribution. How would this income be taxed? Okay. A as a distribution, B as a dividend. C is regular income or D as a capital gain. Let me see here. Let me see here. Yeah, okay. That's looking good. That's looking good. You know what? This is a good question. It it um it does seem to have a lot of moving parts. Okay. So I I think our first step in solving these questions again is RTQF. Read the question first. And then here's the question right here. It says, how would this income be taxed, right? It's asking about the income and how it'd be taxed. But you, you know what? I, I, I think that this is the kind of question that a lot of students are, are going to have a look at and are going to quickly lose a mark on. And I've seen it happen many times, right? T3 slip, which reported a $1,000 distribution. A T3, Mandy received the T3 slip that's reported a $1,000 distribution and your very first answer choice to how this income will be taxed is as a distribution. But how many of you guys would have chosen A? How many of you ladies would have chosen A for that matter? Right? And I use guys and, you know, ladies in the generic sense, but how many of you would have chosen A as an answer right away? And then just moved on to the next question, right? I, I bet you... I want all of you to remember this, right? Sometimes, sometimes you're really trying to catch unprepared students with questions like this. And I think a lot of unprepared students would simply pick answer choice A, lose the mark, not even realize it, and just move on to the next question, all right? So, so let me highlight something here for you right now, all right? Investment income from mutual funds retains its own character. And what this really means is that interest income is treated as regular income and taxed accordingly. Dividend income from Canadian corporations is subject to a, to a gross up and a tax credit process, like I mentioned before. Capital gains is, you know, got its own capital gains rate of 50%, etc. right? But the way mutual fund makes distributions is like this. You've got two types of distributions. You've got dividend distributions and you've got cash distributions, okay? So generally, dividend distributions are set up for reinvestment back into the mutual fund and used to purchase more fund units or shares. Cash, distribu cash distributions, on the other hand, though, are generally given directly to the fund investors as cash, who then take that cash as income. Very often, that's, you know, retirees that are making use of that, all right? So, so for investors that are pre-retirement, most mutual funds are set to automatically reinvest to distributions. For investors that are retired, many mutual funds are set to pay out their distributions in the form of cash. Now, let me ask all you guys a question. This looks complicated, right? What is it? What do we really need to know for sure to answer this question? Okay. Well, there's no mention this is a registered plan. So once again, we would fairly assume that it's non-registered. However, however, I do see that it says here she received a T3 slip. I know T3 slips come from mutual fund trusts, and I also know that they come from mutual fund trusts that are held non-registered, okay? So I know that this is in fact a non-registered fund. And since we know that it's non-registered, this means that the investment income will retain its own character and be reported separately on that T3 form, okay, that T3 slip. So. I guess my question really is, is what type of investment income did, did she receive? Yes, she would have received a distribution, but that's one possible answer. But I think there's a better answer. And I think the better answer really comes down to this. I think it's this key word I'm looking at right now here. This key word right here. Let me see if I can highlight that here on the screen. 
capital gains. I think that's the key word that really tells you what I need to know. I got a suspicion that even though she did receive a distribution, it's going to be characterized as a capital gain because it told us so earlier on in the question, and we just need to really closely pay attention to it, right? So let me find out if that's right. Yeah, it is. It is. All right. So this is a very straightforward, easy question, but it really highlights one key learning point a lot, all right? You've got to do a lot of practice questions, lots and lots of practice questions, and you've got to make mistakes, right? I mean, I mean, you've got to get tricked sometimes and make mistakes, and, and that process of making mistakes is a learning process. That's where you're going to really pick up some, some, you know, some really good learning material there, and, and if you get questions like this where you're kind of scratching your head and you're thinking, how do I approach this? Always step back to basics, okay? RTQF, read the question first, highlight any kind of keywords in the question that are relevant. I would have definitely highlighted T3. I would have definitely highlighted capital gain. But, you know, you've you got to then look at your four answer choices and narrow it down. Is it a distribution? Yes. Is it a dividend? Well, you maybe you could say that. Is it regular income? Definitely not. Is it a capital gain? That's the best correct answer here in this choice. All right. Okay, you know what, let me, uh, before I move on, let me take a quick 30 seconds and just check the YouTube stream for any questions that might have popped up. Let me just see here if I can do that real quickly. Where's my YouTube stream? There it is. All right, what do we have here? All right, so I got I got Vrindia asking a question. Can we still ask questions to see why instructors, even after this boot camp? Uh, it looks like Andre is addressing that right now. Um, I, I, I'm going to say, you know what, if you guys, you know, when this bootcamp you know, webinar series finishes, if you still got a couple of questions, by all means, send them in to us. And one of our trainers is going to reach out to you. We, we'd like to chat with you anyways. Now I, I can't say this is going to happen frequently and often, right? But if you've got one, maybe two questions and a, and a quick five minute conversation after this bootcamp series is done would certainly help you towards your exam then I would certainly like to help you. I know Andre and probably Corey and Rebecca and you know Josh and some of our trainers probably would as well. So send those questions in and we're definitely going to make a point of getting back to you. All right, we might not give you a 15-minute session, but we're definitely going to give you five minutes of our time to help you out, okay? Um, what else here? What else do we have here? Okay, ladder GICs. Okay, I see somebody asking about ladder GICs. Again, it's Verinda asking about ladder GICs. Okay, on Andre's mentioning to talk about tutoring. Okay, I'll leave that with Andre. All right, gotcha. Okay, okay. So um, a, a ladder GIC is this, right? A GIC, typically when you're issued, what you're doing is you're walking into a bank, you're giving money to that bank, you're lending money to the bank, the bank's giving you back a GIC, a guaranteed investment certificate, and that guaranteed investment certificate has a guaranteed rate of return. But it, it's usually often a low rate, maybe 2% or 3%. Now, a ladder GIC is just what it sounds like. Imagine a ladder, each rung on that ladder goes up, and so with a ladder GIC, what you're getting is a higher interest rate at each rung of the ladder, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say, and I'm just gonna make this up. Let's say you got a five-year ladder GIC. Perhaps in year one, they're gonna give you half a percent. Maybe in year two, they're gonna give you 1%. Maybe in year three, they're gonna give you one and a half percent. Maybe in year four, they're gonna give you 2%. And maybe for that last bit of year five, they're gonna give you maybe 3%, a higher rate, okay? so. You know what, you've got different rates occurring on each rung of the ladder. However, when you look at it from an overall point of view and you add up the length of term, the, the, the length of time of this ladder GIC, it's going to work out to maybe an, an aggregate or an average rate of, I don't know, maybe somewhere between 2 and 3%. Okay, but that's how ladder GICs work. Typically, you start off with a low rate, and on each rung of the ladder, as you go further and further towards maturity, you get a higher rate of return, okay? Very safe investments, but again, um, you know, there might be other investment choices out for you, you know, that, that make a lot of sense. Again, depending on your risk tolerance, your investment suitability, your time horizon, and really what your goals are, okay? Great question, that one. 
All right, you know what? Let me uh, let me step back and go into the presentation again. I'm going to move on to question number three. There we go. Okay, question number three. Question number three says, uh, what would the client's capital gain be at redemption? What would the client's capital gain be at redemption? There we go. And we've got a table here. Interesting, interesting. And it's got some dates, January 1st. We have an initial investment, June 30th, 2019. We have a distribution reinvestment. December 31st, we have another distribution reinvestment. And May 1st, 2020, we have a full redemption of all units. Okay, you know what, guys? I want to be clear. Um, if any of you are watching this right now and you're kind of scratching your head and, and you're thinking, how do I even approach this question? I want to be clear. This is a more challenging question. It, it seems to have a couple of moving parts here. Capital gain B at the point of redemption. Okay, at the point of redemption. All right. So that's what it's asking about. Now, secondly, when I look at these four different answer choices, is there anything that I can eliminate quickly? Eh, probably not. <laughs> probably not. This kind of looks like a math question. I mean, it, it really looks like a math question. So there's probably nothing I can get rid of quickly. Um, it, it does kind of, I, I kind of think it might be a gain, right? I mean, I, I see a redemption value here of $12,500, right? At the bottom, I see an initial, an initial investment amount of $10,000. Right, twelve and a half is certainly better than ten. So, so you know, if I was picking a choice real quickly, I might say A. Um, what do you guys think? You think A is right? I, I, I don't know. Let's let's find out. Okay. Again, let me highlight something here. There's no mention whether this is registered or non-registered. Okay, so we have to fairly assume that it's non-registered, and the client's going to receive a T3 slip. Now. Secondly, I, I want to make another point here. This is a distribution, right? You got a distribution here on June 30th and another distribution here on December 31st. Okay. What could this client have done with this distribution if she took it in cash? Right? Could, what could she have done with this money if she took it in cash? Well, you know, she, she could have done a lot of things. I mean, she could have gone on a vacation. Right, I certainly need one right now. She could have bought a boat. I don't know. She could have bought a new computer. Right, Maybe whatever. the The point is, is what did she decide to do with the money? Right, and I want to highlight these two rows here for a second. What she decided to do with the money is this: she reinvested the money, the distribution money, to buy more units. She reinvested to buy more units. Okay, so I I think. I think what we really need to do is to determine how much money she's got invested in this mutual fund or or rather what her total cost base or or what we, we actually call her adjusted cost base or ACB is. I think that's what we need to determine, okay? So how do we calculate the adjusted cost base of this mutual fund of her investment? Well, it's simple. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take the, the value of her initial investment we're gonna add on the two different reinvested amounts that she made. And, and from there, we're gonna determine what the total value or her adjusted cost base is, okay? So she's got a $10,000 initial investment. She reinvested 1,500, that makes it a 11,500. And then she added on another 1,500 to make it, uh, what is that, 115 plus 1,500 is 13,000, is that right? Is that, is that, no, that's not right. No, no, I made a mistake. I made a, I made a mistake. I should have used the calculator, right? You know what? I misread that. That's, that's $1,500 on the second line, but that's more. It's $1,600 on the third line. I, I misread that. And you know what? That's a great point. I'm glad I made that mistake because I think a lot of, a lot of people might've made that same mistake as well. All right, so something to be mindful of and be careful of, all right? It's really easy to miss the fact that these two distribution amounts were not the same and to make the same math mistake I just made. And, and it wouldn't surprise me if I went through the rest of this making that same math mistake. It wouldn't surprise me if one of those answer choices was for that mistaken answer because that's the kind of nasty trick I would do when I build exam questions. 
right? So I think I've said this before, but guys like me that create exam questions, we like to throw in their answer choices that sometimes really nail you down, you know, for making simple mistakes. So always be careful about that, all right? So $10,000 plus $1,500. I know it's $11,500. I add on $1,600. I think that's going to be $13,100 actually. Yeah, $13,100. Okay. And how do we calculate the proceeds? Well, we simply take what we sold the mutual fund for, which is $12,500, and we subtract our adjusted cost base of $13,100. And, and I think we're going to actually maybe take a loss on it. Um, I think we'll take a loss of maybe $600 on this fund. But you know what, let me, let me see if I can bring the math up here for you on the screen to make it more clear. Because, um, you know, me talking is one thing, you actually seeing it as something else. There we go. All right, there we go. So there's the adjusted cost base. We've got a $10,000 initial investment plus $1,500 reinvested plus $1,600 reinvested. That's $13,100 are our costed base, right? Adjusted cost base. Proceeds is $12,500 minus our $13,000, 100 adjusted cost base, that is a $600 loss. Guys, is that the right answer? Let me find out here. Yes, it is. It is, all right? So, so we might have leaned initially toward thinking there was a profit or, or a gain at the beginning of this question, but now we've confirmed it's actually a loss, right? Great question. That, that one kind of threw me, and I, and I learned something from that one. All right. All right, let's move on. What do we have here? I think that's all the questions we have for today. Yes, yes. What's next? What's next? I see a note here. Mention Andre on la... Oh, yeah. Guys, I've got a surprise announcement for all of you. This is great. This is good. As many of you know, one of our key trainers and directors here at CY Learning is a gentleman named Andre Samuels. He's most often the face of many of our introductory level courses, such as uh, mutual funds, securities, uh, life insurance, licensing programs, etc., He's a very skilled regulatory trainer and study coach with over 25 years of banking and investment industry training experience. And I'm very proud to say that he's one of my personal close friends. Now, Andre's actually been shadowing us for the last couple of weeks on this whole program. Um, he's been answering questions on the live YouTube stream you know, as I've been hosting this series, because I can, you know, I'm not a very bright guy. I can only do one thing at a time, right? But, but Andre is going to be joining us next week to share a few words of his wisdom and experience in taking courses like this, in studying, and in getting ready to write exams. So next week, I encourage all of you, please make a point of joining us for the live final webinar in the series. And please feel free to invite any friends or colleagues, you know, from your office or, you know, from your community that you want as well, the more the merrier. Okay. Final note here, as you can see on the screen, again, please make sure to keep track of your progress using the CY study schedule for your course. And again, if you do have an active subscription, book a complimentary one-on-one -on -one session below. There's the link for you, www.cylearning.com forward slash bootcamp. Space is limited. It is first come, first served. But so far, we haven't missed a single person that's made a request, you know, to, to talk with one of our trainers, All right? So if you haven't had the opportunity yet to talk with our trainers, definitely send in your request. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to make a spot for you. All right. Let me just do a quick final check and see if there's any final questions here. Okay. Let me check the YouTube stream. I got multiple communications going on right now. Where's my YouTube stream? There we go. Fantastic. You know what, guys? Everything looks good. I think we've answered everything for you. Guys, good luck with your studies. Enjoy the rest of the program. And I do look forward to hearing from many of you on Friday. You guys take care and have a great Tuesday afternoon.